just crazy, like thinking about what people go through to accomplish their dreams and accomplish their goals. Like I was not the most talented compulsory kid. I wasn't very flexible. I had so many fears. I was not very disciplined because I just chatted with my friends the whole time. But the one thing that I think really attributed to my success in the sport was my mind. All right, here we go. We're live. Um, I'm super pumped, thankful to be here with someone who needs very minimal introduction. I think you've had the most titles of hats worn in gymnastics. We have national team member, Olympics, business owner, coach, UCLA, NCAA champion, entrepreneur, all of it. Uh, Samantha Pezik, how you doing? Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, man, I'm, uh, I'm happy to have you on and it's cool to connect enough. So it's not like a, a passing in hallways at uh, something here or there, like the thing we did in Boston together. That was like 20 minutes real quick to say hello, but although we did get dinner after, so that was kind of part of it, but it's too Either quick. That or the best chance we have is probably high-fiving in an airport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With our travel schedules, right? For sure. So what's it, uh, what's it been like for you lately, man? You're like wearing, like I said, all hats. You've, you've done many things. You're still wearing many hats. What's life been like for you? Crazy? Yeah. I mean, you know, at the start of the year, it's always NCAA season. So I'm, I'm an analyst for the Pac-12 Networks, um, gone every weekend calling meets. And during the week, I'm getting my uh, summer plan set for Be With Me boot camp. So it's kind of like a seven day a week work schedule. But um, I always say that I'm really lucky because uh, all the careers that I'm doing are things that I'm really passionate about and things that I love. So I feel yeah. like when you are working like crazy, it's things that I would probably be doing even if I didn't get paid for them. So it's really cool to kind of do that. So as crazy as it is, I am just as thankful to be doing them. But yes, um, it's been really nuts since April. Um, and then I think I had pretty much a month off to get ready for the beam queens of the summer um getting yep. the location set getting everyone's travel schedule getting the staff hired and all the promoting and everything and we just finished our third location our fourth event of the summer so we're right mm -hmm. in the thick of things um i leave in a couple days for colorado for that beam um, queen and then, um have a couple weekends off so it's just non-stop on my end and and you know how it is dave like a lot of people just don't understand people ask me all the time like what do you do like I think I don't know if people just think I sit in my bed and like eat bonbons all day or go watch Netflix or play video games but yeah. it's really confusing I'm like I literally do everything <laughs> like everything yeah. that you see I I do that so yeah. um yeah I mean it's been non-stop but it's been good and that's the craziest part too right is like the thing about owning a business especially in the gymnastics world is like there's nobody else to blame it on it's always like you're the end of the road you're the yeah. end like all problems are your fault. So like you always have to answer everybody. Totally. Yeah. And, and even yesterday, I mean, I am such a perfectionist, obviously where we come from a sport that values perfection or the illusion of perfection. Right. And so even in my business and my brand, I want things a certain way and I get, you know, super irritated if they're not exactly perfect all the time and yesterday I sent a parent reminder for the weekend and I forgot to switch the days so yeah. I was a reminder this is this is the the schedule for the weekend and it was the wrong days so oh, then I just sent no. another email saying correction and then I put the wrong month so I made <laughs> two like very serious in a row bloopers last and right like, something like that. I had to make a joke of it to all the parents like I'm I'm going to be fired at this point from myself because everyone's I'm leaving myself of duty. Yeah. And it's the worst making mistakes, but, um, they happen every once in a while. Yeah. I was wondering, I was like, I wonder if like between rotations at meet, she's like answering emails and she's like doing stuff for camps. Like she's like trying to focus on like as much as you can, but she's not actually like, sometimes she has to like jump back and forth. It's like emergencies flutter. Lucky, luckily for Pac-12, I have to be fully engaged <laughs> in the meeting. <laughs> That's your contract, there's right? Somewhere. There's no way I'm answering emails, but sometimes my phone will be ringing and it's an important call and I'm like, like I can't take this oh, right now because I'm honestly on air. <laughs> but yeah, exactly right. That, things can wait. What's a, uh, this is a bias, a loaded question, but like what's your favorite to do? Is it based on the season or is it based on like, obviously like in college season, you'd rather be sprout, like broadcasting stuff. Is it like summer you'd rather be doing this or is there one that sticks out? Actually, I've, I've had people ask me that a lot. And to be honest, when I, I 
got started in broadcasting, that was my end goal. I wanted to do sports broadcasting. I want to have my own sports talk show. Um, football's yeah. my favorite sport. Um, so that was kind of the direction that I was, I was working towards. And then um, people don't tell you that in broadcast, it's like a struggling actor's life and you don't actually get paid um, to live on that money. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll do camps or things that I know. And then I got this idea for being queen and I was like, okay, I'm just going to do one a year. It'll be like, you know, something that I'm passionate about that I can give back, but also be like a little money maker for me on the side to help pay for my life in LA yeah. while I'm pursuing broadcast. And then I had no idea I was going to enjoy it and, and it was going to fulfill me in ways that it has. Whereas yeah. kind of now I'm pursuing both and I was mm -hmm kind of expecting for one of them to, to fall through the cracks and be more successful than the rest. But Please fall apart. Like, Please fall apart. Yeah. They're kind of on the same level now. So, um, yeah, I, the way I say it is I'm, it's seasonal jobs. So I have, you know, NCAA season, then I have being queen season, then I have mm. football season. Right, um, right. And so it's kind of perfect because right when I start to get burned out with one, it's over <laughs> and I get to switch to the next. Yeah, and then for sure. No, I miss it. <laughs> like I yeah. miss podcasting, but by the end of NCAA season, I just didn't want to go to LAX for another day and like stay in a hotel. <laughs> I just didn't want to do the research for the meets at all. I was just burnt out. And then I get to do being queen and then I'm sure to ask me in about a month from now and I will be so looking forward to broadcast season yeah, again. Exactly right. Yeah, so yeah, it's that's kind cool. of the best of both worlds. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can definitely feel that vibe. I uh, wear many hats as well. And there's sometimes when I'm, I'm really happy being a clinical, you know, helping people with injuries or sometimes when the clinic gets brutal and I just want to coach or sometimes when I just want to like work on like nerdy stuff and back end business stuff. But it's, it's good to be able to jump back and forth because I think it's, uh, it, it's really hard to stay one track only on one thing for so long. Yeah. And, and I think later down the line, you know, if I wanted to choose, I kind of have that luxury since I'm, you know, working really hard to build both of them up, I'm hoping that one day it's going to pay off and, you know, I can decide, I can, I can hold off on deciding which one I'm really going to move forward with, uh, you know, full time or, or more full time than it is now. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That's pretty sweet. seems like you're going in the right direction. It seems like it's, uh, at least it looks like from the outside, you're juggling all the plates well and people seem to be loving the camps and they seem to obviously be loving your broadcasting and stuff like that. So it seems to be going well. Thank you. Yeah. I've, uh, people always say that to me like, Oh, you live, it looks like you live such a fun life. Like that's awesome that I look like I'm portraying that I'm having such a fun life. <laughs> you look like I have my crap together. I'm doing something yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go, I was thinking about how to start this and I was going to, I'm taking a page out of your book. I was thinking about the first time that we ever met and, and crossed paths and I was looking back. So the first time we met, right, was in 2011 at Svetlana Boganskaya's OGC camp in Florida and I found this picture. Can you see this? Oh my gosh. Isn't that crazy? Much. That was, uh, oh, I don't wow. know how I found this in my like the tombs of my uh, iPhoto, but I remember like the blur in and out and like a quick high buy and then that was it. The rest was over. I think we like, we went out like to dinner one time and your wrist was like not doing well. And you're like, can you fix this? I was like, uh, I just started undergrad in PT school. So no, oh, I can't help you at all. I have, I had a, a disability in college. I wasn't around, allowed to write because my wrist would lock. I can only, I can still only bend. <laughs> like this. Yeah. It's crazy. It just, it's like permanently like in yoga this morning, I, I have to do this on the ground. So I ask anybody, they say it, I'm like, Hey, give it a, get us, give it a swig. See if you can uh, fix it. Everybody else has tried. Yeah. I, I felt bad because I couldn't do anything, but also it wasn't even functional. Like you couldn't eat with your fork. You're like, I'm having a tough time bending my wrist back. And I was like, yikes, man, this is really tough. <laughs> my handwriting. Cause it's my right hand really looks like chicken scratch, like a, like a six year old boy. So <laughs> I have to type. <laughs> yeah, man, I feel, I feel that. Unfortunately, I think at this point, it's probably only surgery, not to bust your bubble, but. Yeah, I'm like, over it. I'm over it. <laughs> yoga for days. This is just you for the rest of your life, but. Okay. Yeah, happen. so, yeah, <laughs> exactly, right? You can live, right? You can live with one power, okay. your power hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm looking through these questions, and I think it's good to start after we talked about, like, the monstrous path you've been through. Like, what do you think is, I don't know, it's weird looking back probably now to be like, wow, at one point I was 
at the Olympics. And I go, wow, at one point I was like at UCLA with Val, like this big deal. Like, I don't know, what's your reflection back on the whole journey from like, I don't know, I don't even know personally, but when did you start like national team and stuff like that to where you are now? Um, well, no, I started when I was two and then, um, had to repeat level four and level five. And when yeah. I was five years old, I decided I wanted to go to the Olympics, even though I was really bad at gymnastics at the time, but I was just this cocky little kid that had a goal. I, I, you know, when you're five, you have no idea what it means to say you want to go to the Olympics. I just saw it on TV and told my parents and my teachers and my coaches that that's what I was going to do one day. And so, <laughs> Um, not knowing how tough the road was going to be, that was kind of always in the back of my mind, even though I wasn't a very good gymnast. So I had to yeah. repeat level four, repeat level five. And to me, I still thought I was going to make the Olympics. I had no idea, like, it was a road to get there and you have to be this amount of this good and whatever. That was just the goal. And so um, I did tops. I did make tops national team. I was really strong, but I wasn't very flexible. And a lot of people told me I would never make national team or I would never make a, you know, assignment or the Olympics if I didn't get more flexible. And I'm not kidding. I, when I tell you that I spent so much of my childhood stretching um, and it just isn't how my body was built. And yeah. so I did get a little bit more flexible, probably like my max potential of flexibility. Um, but yeah, I started started getting pretty good. Um, made the national team when I was 12. Um, my first time at the ranch as a national team member was an international assignment. Um, competed at nine different countries. Uh, did a world championships in there. And mm -hmm. made the Olympic team, and it's and and then went off. Had two more years of high school, <laughs> and yeah. then college. Yeah, whatever. We'll get yeah. there when I get. <laughs> so it's really crazy because I think the further out that I get, the more I appreciate the journey that I had. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't really have regrets because I think that I, you know, gave one hundred percent of my effort every time I was in the gym, and I think that's why I have no regrets is because. I was able to say that about my training. Um, but just looking back, I mean, I think I would have rather, I would have appreciated, I wish I would have appreciated how good I was back then because for me doing it every day and you know, you're working on corrections, you're working on new skills. Like you don't really realize how good you are. I mean, I made the Olympics and I didn't think I was good, yeah. you know? like things like that, that are mind boggling, or like, I thought I was fat back then, you know, or that I thought like it, you have, you're in this world and, and you've thought all these things just because that's the weight that you carry in the sport, especially at mm -hmm. that level. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, on the, again, the further away that I get, the more I look back and I'm like, dang, wow, I can't believe I was only 12 and I could do all these skills or like, I can't believe that I did this and also did school at the same time. So it kind of, you know, when I look back, I'm more you know, thankful and appreciative of myself because I can't believe that I, I even did that. So I mean, going through and then when I got to college, it was a really hard transition mentally for me because, you know, I think at the elite level, you're... <laughs> you're brainwashed a little bit and I don't know whether that comes from the coaches or that comes from us or that come, that just came from me. But because the level of difficulty is so much lower in college, I just felt like it was silly college gymnastics. And so my first year there, you know, I got really out of shape. I gymnastics was still easy for me because the skills were so much lower difficulty than what I was used to. Um, and I just wasn't happy with myself because it, I wasn't giving my all in the gym and I yep. knew that, but there was just, I just needed a, a break, I think. And so I think mm -hmm. it took me until my sophomore year to really understand how cool college gymnastics is and how amazing yep. it is. And now looking back, I mean, I'm one of the biggest advocates for college gymnastics. Like it's the right. best in the world. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, that kind of was a tough transition. I think just coming from the elite world and working out so many hours and, you know, doing it a certain way and then kind of being able to have fun in the gym and find that joy when you practice is, is a big mm -hmm. transition. Yeah, for sure. It's so there's a couple of things that are really like crazy to me in there. So one is something that a lot of gymnasts struggle with. And I struggled a lot when I was a gymnast is like, there's so many good things happening, but it's wild how your brain just clings onto the negative things about how like, this isn't right. Or you have like this negativity bias about, you know, something not going well, like it's crazy to think that you were like at the Olympic level and you were doing such, such good gymnastics, but you still were like 
clinging on to the negative things. It's really hard to separate, especially in our perfectionist sport that is like always better, always better, something now, new skill, new skill. And you could get to the top of the top, like, okay, now invent a new skill and do it perfect every time. It's like, all right, that's maybe not a healthy mindset. <laughs> right. I mean, but, yeah, that's business though too, because it was interesting. Um, when I started Beam Queen, I got the idea for Beam Queen about a year before I actually did the first one. Um, mm. Just kind of planning it and brainstorming and just really wanting it to be well thought out before I announced it or even like went for it. Um, right. And a lot of the times when I was doing it, I was really down on myself. I was hard on myself. Like, what makes me qualified to start a business? I'm yeah. right out of college. Like, what makes me qualified to coach all these kids and to do all this stuff? And I had to take a second and, like, laugh because all of the messages that we teach the girls at Game Queen Boot Camp is exactly the message that I needed to, to tell myself when yep. getting the business up and running. And so I think it's just that imposter syndrome a lot of people, a lot of females suffer from too, but, um, of just being like, okay, what makes me qualified? Like people were emailing me things. I had no idea, but I just sounded confident. I was like, I'm going to go with that. You're it's, like on the phone. You're like, oh yeah, yeah. Like Googling as you talk, like what are yeah, quarterly. Like, <laughs> is your business this? Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, -huh. you know, uh -huh. and so it's kind of like, you don't know what you don't know. And so going through it every day, people are like, what's your day to day? Like, I'm like, well, I wake up and try and figure out what I don't know so I can teach myself what I don't know and then implement the thing that I just taught myself. And so that's kind of like the story of the past three years. Like last year I, you know, did broadcast in gymnastics and then I taught a workout class for the gym fire. I've never taught a class before. Beam Queen was the first full summer. I did sideline for football for the first time. Like last year was the year of first for me and everything yeah. brand new. So I'm just excited this year to have some sort of bearings of like, yeah, well, last year we did this and have something to compare things to. Whereas last year was like, I don't know how this is going to go. Like, we'll, we'll see. I'm going to try my best. <laughs> Yeah. And I guess like I get another follow-up question is from the gymnastics world, whether it's new skills and stuff like that, but also the business world. And like, I you know just the fear of the unknown is a big, big part of everyone's lives. And I think everybody has a universal response when something is new, uncertain, they don't know. And they get this like pit in their stomach. It's like this voice squawk in your head, like, don't do it. You can't like, don't run away, run away. Like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people get what they call sometimes like just a situational anxiety for like actually pulling the trigger. Like, what do you, I don't know. How'd you get through all that stuff you just mentioned of like, you probably pulled the mic up and you're like, I should run. I should run. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was like this as an athlete too. I'm a very factual person. I had to know the why, like in order for my coach to really get me to buy into wanting to learn a certain skill or changing my routine or like just certain things. Like I would have to understand why we were doing that right. for me to be like, yeah, this is the right decision. And so I think Especially being an entrepreneur, you don't really have anybody to bounce ideas off of um, and talk to certain, I mean, I have some friends and stuff that I would, but you know, really it's you making that final decision. And so if it's right or wrong, like that's on you. And so for me, whenever I would get down, I would kind of try and see what was factual. Like, okay, mm -hmm. is this, am I factually bad at business or do I, is that just the negative voice in my head? You know, and if it's a negative voice, then I need to find something factual and make it more of like a neutral comment. Like, no, I just don't know enough right now. So right. it's going to make me feel more confident. Okay, I'm going to read more books. I'm going to listen to more podcasts. I'm going to call a mentor. So I start building my confidence level up because there has to be a reason that I was feeling that I was bad at whatever it was I was telling myself I was bad at. And mm. so kind of for me, figuring out like an action plan, if you will, of that negative self-talk and, and in gymnastics, I had really terrible fears. And so for me, it was like, okay, why am I afraid? And so the most mm -hmm. frustrating thing in gymnastics was me not knowing why, why I was afraid. And yep. so I think looking back now, I was afraid of my power, but at the time I just needed more muscle memory, more repetitions to believe in myself. So instead of telling myself, like, I'm always going to be scared forever. It's like, okay, what am I going to do to not be scared in the future? I'm not someone that's going to be always scared. You know, it's more of a situational thing that you have to just get out of the rut instead of you're always that way. That yeah. Sense. Yeah, no, totally. And, uh, 
you know, we do not have to go into it, but I study a lot of neuroscience for this kind of stuff. And there's a very legit geeky reason why that happens. It's kind of like evolutionary, but it's wild different parts of your brain talking to each other. And like one will override the other when you have more factual information, like different parts of your brain. So it's, it's, it's very real. It's, it's situational, like you said, but if you can give somebody more facts about like a technical aspect of a drill, which is why they're not going to land on their head or what they need to do to do there. Or like you said, if you're in a terrible situation where you have like school or business, you can look stuff up, find more information and get a little bit more like secure and like, all right, I think I actually know what this problem is and now I can address it. Right. I love that stuff too. And it's really crazy. i I don't like fun books, as silly as that sounds. I only like books that I can learn something from and yeah. self-help books. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> clearly you hate books too. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, my first year out of school, I was, the whole fall I had off. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not in school right now, so I'm going to put myself through school. And so I kind of like put myself through this rigorous self-help <laughs> schooling where I read like yeah, every – yeah, every book that you could possibly read. And it was interesting hearing their stories and their like negative thought where I'm like, okay, this isn't just a me thing. Like this is people go through ebbs and flows. And so then yep. when I actually started my business and it was happening to me. I was like, okay, I've read about this. You know, it happens. You know, people feel this way. People feel lonely when they work by themselves. So this is how they fix it. People do this. So it's like, even though it was new to me, I was trying to read as much as I could and study as much as I could so I could, you know, not make the same mistakes that everybody else was making. <laughs> that yeah. No, absolutely, man. I did the same thing, right? So like my uh, shift started out of a, a blog post that became like somebody wanting to get a clinic. And I was like, yeah, I'll start a company. And then, like the first year and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, at all. And it was just like chaos, like total panic. Right. But like, again, you read books, you talk to mentors, you study people online, like you figure out some ins and outs and you slowly like crawl your way uphill. But the unfortunate reality is that like nothing meaningful comes without work and a little bit of discomfort. So like the only way out is through and you have to just figure that stuff out as you go. Right. Yeah. And another thing that I, I always kind of do, I've always kind of done growing up too, is I'm a big like A plus B equals C kind of person. So mm -hmm. I'm the type of person that has like a million thoughts at the at, at one time and like I have this huge vision and like I, I get very overwhelmed by my own like goals because yeah. sometimes yeah. they're so big that I don't even know where to start or like which ones are good ones that I should pursue and which ones are like walking on the moon and like mm -hmm. I, just like which ones are like tangible it, it just so shit like sifting through all of those in my own brain is tough sometimes. So making it really simple, like a problem like A plus B equals C. Okay. Like if I want this to be the end result and I'm here, like what's the B in that? You know, what do I need to do? Do I need to hire somebody? Do I need to learn about it? Do I need to, what is that missing piece to the puzzle? So C happens. So that's yeah. also something that helps me a lot. Absolutely, man. I'm a whiteboard hero. Like I have those moments where I'm like sitting at this desk and I'm like, I can't, it's in my head too much. I can't do it. And I'll just put two whiteboards out and just spill it all out. And I can look back and I'm like, all right, at least I got like, it's out there at least. And I can look at it a little bit. Some people do it with a journal, but that helps me a lot. Oh my gosh. Like a month ago, I think it was like a month ago, maybe two months at this point, but it was before Beam Queen had started and I was taking a shower and in the shower, I had this thought, I was like, I need a videographer to travel. I need to start a YouTube yep. channel. Like I need to start a lot of people reach out that they can't come because they're overseas and they want the education. Like how can I help people that actually can't be there learn some of what we're doing? And so I got out of the shower and I tweeted or Instagrammed looking for a videographer. <laughs> and yeah. the next day I had like eight Skype interviews <laughs> and yep. now I have like the coolest, best videographer, but it was all because in the shower, I like had this amazing idea and I, I knew it was going to create so much more work for me, but I had to do it. It's such a blessing and a curse. Yep. Yep. It's good, man. It's, it's amazing how much like those little ideas spark into something like you don't realize how good it is when you finally have it. Like, geez, I can't believe I got along this long without this. I needed this. I know. I'm like, gosh, I need to stop having good ideas because I just don't have time to pursue any more like ancillary activities here. Yeah. And then you know what you do is that you get a, you find one that you really set up in Beam Queen and you get a couple of videographers and you film the whole thing and you put it as a course online. Then you're really talking about helping a lot of people. Uh, it's too good. I can't sell this. <laughs> yeah. You got to be here live in the flesh. Yeah. Uh, sweet. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, speaking of Beam Queen Bootcamp, you must have like a ton of young gymnasts who come and are asking you like, 
how did you do this? And how did you get the Olympics? And how did you go to college? And how do I go to UCLA? And I want to talk to Miss Val. Like, what do you, I don't know, what do you tell these young kids with such high, high dreams when you know in the back of your mind, like, oh, it's a lot of work coming your way. It's a lot of work coming your way. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, we, t- we talk to the staff all the time about this. I don't know if, if the camp just breeds really great, great humans inside and out, like good gymnasts, uh, in terms of their work ethic or they're just, you know, showing off for the weekend or maybe a little bit of both. Um, but all of the, the girls are really hardworking. They're really passionate. Um, we don't get really any bratty kids. No, none of the attitude stuff. Um, it is boot camp style, so there's not really <laughs> enough time to maybe do that. Maybe that's the reason. But after day one, um, I asked the staff one question for the girls. What was your biggest beam obstacle and how did you overcome it? And, you know, mm-hmm. I had a lot of fears growing up. Uh, I know Bridget, she didn't have fears of skills, but she was like, had a fear of competition and could mm-hmm. never make her beam routine. And so between the staff, the girls get to hear pretty much all of the, the beam obstacles that you could possibly have and how we got through it. Because I know yeah. when I was their age, I felt alone having fears because no one talked about it. No one in my gym had fears. I was alone. I felt like I was the only person to, to be going through this. And I never thought I was going to make it to the Olympics or make it to college if I still had these like plaguing fears. And so just talking to them about it and saying like, you know, you're going to get through this and it's horrible right now. And here's some things that helped me, but it's, it's just the worst. (laughs) And if you stick with it one day, you're going to wake up and and appreciate the fact that you stuck with it, no matter what your beam obstacle is. And you know, it applies to all, all other events. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, well, first, the reason that you don't have a lot of like, you know, brats and there's good humans around you is because you're a good human and you probably attract people who want to hang out with you. So give yourself some credit there. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? So I think that there's a lot of these times when um, that's, that's something I'm noticing a lot more in gymnastics is changing is like a lot of people I think suffer in silence in terms of like mental blocks or then like the start of a nagging injury, or they're just scared of like competition and stuff. And I think I'm happy to see that starting to change a little bit too, is like the ability to give gymnasts more of an open voice about like how they're feeling and not like judge people or like have people throw in shade their way because they're like staying about like everybody has the same problems in different forms if that makes sense you know one person's giant is one person's layout step out is one person's like just walking on the mat at a meet and I think I'm happy to see coaches starting to handle those questions a little bit better yeah yeah I mean people my teammates used to ask me like you never fall on series I'm like yeah because I'm so afraid of it I would never want to be (laughs) And so because I never had a scary fall, I never got hurt doing it. I never saw anybody get hurt doing it. It was even more frustrating because I was good at it. I just was afraid. And so um, I think it was so frustrating for everybody to watch me go through that, just as frustrating as it was for me to have to go through it. And so um, because they would fall in competitions, I would always, I, I was a gamer. I could handle competition. I liked the pressure but I had the fears. So I think everybody kind of deals with a little bit of something here and there when you go through the sport. But I always say that I think I became the beam worker that I was in college and towards the end of my elite career because I had those fears. Like there was times in practice where I couldn't do it on the high beam. And so I would do like four times the, the numbers on the floor or the low beam and, you know, just getting those repetitions in is building muscle memory, is yeah. building your mind. And so finally, you know, when I got to the second half of my elite career in college, I wasn't really afraid anymore. And I hit mm. it most of the time. I never really fell. And mm. it's insane to say that, but I, I had done so many numbers as a young gymnast because I was afraid that I think that's why I was so good towards the end of my career. Yeah, it's wild, right? Like when you listen to, I mean, this is not just gymnastics, but you listen to people's stories, like it's typically the person who had the bigger fear or like the bigger amount of adversity seemed to come through and always like slingshot like back with like the most success. And I don't know where I heard this. It might've been like a coach or a friend, but they always said like, don't treat it as rock bottom, treat it as a trampoline. Like in the moment it feels terrible. But if you can realize that like at the other side of it is something like really, really valuable. I think that when you, if you can have that mindset during it, when your brain's like, squawking at you like that's a huge thing for I think people to take away is like usually it comes with more of a slingshot effect than anything else like that (laughs) yeah it was I think it was Thanksgiving last year or two years ago we're doing something or making food something just not related to gymnastics at all and my mom just looks at me she's like can you believe that you made it to the Olympics I was like (laughs) 
like eight years ago. Um, yeah, I, how weird Thanks, is that? Mom. Thanks, yeah, mom. It just, it's still so crazy. Like, like uh, you just really went through a lot, <laughs> you know? And so it's, it's just crazy, like, thinking about what people go through to accomplish their dreams and accomplish their goals. Like, I was not the most talented compulsory kid. I wasn't very flexible. I w had so many fears. I was not very disciplined because I just chatted with my friends the whole time. But the one thing that I think really attributed to my success in the sport was my mind. Mm. And even though I didn't understand how my mind worked when I was a young gymnast, because it gave me lots of fears and, and, you know, prevented me from moving up levels at the beginning. I think it was ultimately my asset and the biggest reason that I was able to compete rock solid. And that became my role as an elite competitor in, in college because I wasn't going to fall. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's crazy, right? People always think the, the battle, so to speak, is with an external thing. It's with like a new skill. It's with a business. It's with like speaking publicly. It's with a meet, but it's not. It's the, the battle is going on between your ears. Like if you can conquer that one, chances are you're going to be pretty good with whatever's going on outside. Right. And it's crazy. Like I've gone through that too, right? This is, a, this is actually a known fact now, but I got kicked out of physical therapy school my last graduate year. $200,000 in debt, about to be done with my clinicals, getting my doctorate, and I got kicked out for like bombing a clinical. So I've, I've, I've familiarized myself with that, but too, but in the mindset, you're like, this is the worst thing that could ever possibly happen to me. But now, like, I think I'm an okay physical therapist now. And I think a lot of that only comes because I had this like half chip on my shoulder, half like drive to be like, I'm never going to experience that feeling again. Like I refuse to feel that again. Yeah. I was an alternate one time. And I swore I would never in a million years be an alternate again. It was mm. horrible. I still mm. remember the girl that beat me. I still remember her name. She had the best meet of her life. I fell twice. I, I lost to her by 0.025 as a level 10. It's, it's still crushing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It's, uh, it's hard to see when you're that like emotionally blinded, but like, if you give it a, a week or so and then you can recalibrate yourself, like it actually does get better. And I think that um, Becky said that with her experience with some of her elite stuff and some other people have said as well, like in the moment, like you can't even see because you're seeing red so bad. But like after a week, like a little Netflix, some ice cream, maybe like a couple of days away from the gym, like it's going to get better. I promise it's going to get better. <laughs> but at that same time, you do have to actually make steps, right? You have to do something productively. You can't passively wait and be like, when's it coming? When am I going to feel great? Like you have to actually work it. For sure. Um, and shifting gears, I guess, on the college scene a little bit, um, I cannot go through an episode with not asking your opinion um, about what it's like to be with Val. And uh, I've been lucky to uh, become friends with Val since like, we talked at GymCon together and we've had a lot of really good talks in the last couple of years about gymnastics. And uh, I mean, I'm more blown away by her every time I talk with her somehow. I don't know how that happens, but Danusha cried on the podcast, so don't, you have to live up to something, no big deal. But she was talking about Val no, and her- always cries. It's not, it's not shocking. <laughs> no. <laughs> she's she is an easy cry like I'm not I love her to death but like she was crying at gym con like just being happy and I was like are we okay here are we all right <laughs> but yeah she was just saying that you know watching Val go through what she did and like her she's still in the gym she's still trying to be upbeat through chemo and stuff like not only that stuff but can you speak to like what it really is like to be in the trenches with Val yeah I mean when I was getting recruited by her we started building such a good relationship and I remember my dad saying one time, you know, when you get to college, she's not going to be like this cool. Like she's going to be <laughs> your coach. I'm like, I know, I know. But like, you know, she has it in her <laughs> basically. I'm like, I know she's going to be like more strict than she is now, but I can tell that she cares about what I want to do after, after gymnastics. And she cares about me as a person and, um, you know, coming through the elite world, that's what I was hungry for really. Mm -hmm. And so, um, going to college. Uh, I think she's a little bit stricter on the freshmen just to kind of make sure they're like doing okay and, yeah. and keeping in line. And I was a little bit of a, a rebel my freshman year. So, um, that's, that's fair. Uh, but yeah, no, even through it, like she was the exact same. Like I would call my dad being like, I don't know. Nope. She's still the same as when she was yeah. recruiting. Like very yeah. caring would call me into her office and ask me how school's going and ask me how boys are going and ask me if I've gotten off campus to explore LA or, you know, like very little of my team of my meetings with Val ever would talk about gymnastics to be honest. Right. And right. so, um, that meant a lot to me and, you know, going to college in general, I was really far away from my family. I'm not one that was going to get homesick, but it was nice knowing that I had a mother figure 
at school if I needed something. And now since then, I mean, she's been, you know, a mom to me, a friend to me, a mentor to me, a coach to me. And she has yep. worn so many hats um, in somebody that I respect so, so, so much. And so, I mean, there's not enough things to say about her. I, I think I was a senior or fifth year when she was going through chemo. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just really hard for me to, to have to watch. My grandma the year before, who was my best friend, actually passed away um, oh, nice. because of cancer. And so just that fear of somebody else that I loved going mm -hmm. through that and her wanting to like, put on a brave face for us. Like we were all really like not con confused, I guess, on how to act because she didn't want us to worry, but naturally yeah. because we loved her. We wanted to worry. And so finding that balance of kind of as, a, as a leader of the team, like getting the team focused on the gym and our goals there, but also, you know, taking the time to, to worry and, and be comforting to, somebody who was our leader and somebody that we love so much. Yeah. It's so hard, right? Because like half your brain is like, you want to give everything you possibly can to make sure she's okay and help her through it. But at the same time, um, you know that she would want you to continue like training hard and pressing on. And yeah, I'm familiar with that too. Like a family member close passed away of uh, lung cancer. And it's really hard in the moment. You're like, I want to care for you, but you want me to live my life and keep working. Right. And it's like a really tough spot. That's why I mean, cancer is such a brutal disease. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not enough, um, Words, positive, thing. Uh, yeah. positive words to to describe Val, but I mean, since I've gra I think I think out of all my experiences with her, the thing that makes me appreciate her even more is when I graduated. I'm just as close to her, if not more close to her now, than when I was on the team. And so, her making that effort to you know check in with me, and it's a little bit different because I I see them or I, I saw her this past year at meets and I still kind of like work in that world. So it's a little bit easier, but still like making that effort and, and still treating me like one of her daughters and, and one of her friends, like that means so much to me because it's somebody that I've looked up to for so long. Yeah. Like she genuinely cares about like you as a human and like gymnastics is part of it. But like, it's that like knowing in the back of your mind that she like honestly cares about who you are deeply is like something that's really, really impactful. Yeah. And on the, on the UCLA front, um, do you have any notable stories that we can share about Danusha? When we, she was on, she talked about, I think you were involved actually, the infamous sandbag uh, on the beach and she got oh. like this really sunburn. She said it was a hot mess. She said she was not, that was her worst day she said, but I don't know, is there anything good we can share to dig up dirt on her? Yeah. So we, I don't know if Noosh said this, but her and Noosh and I were actually partners on this yeah. day. Yep. And we got in so much trouble. I think I was a junior or a senior, but we went. So like, this was the course of the day. I'm just going to recap it to, and oh, then you guys, and find the happy medium of what actually happened. But we went yeah. to the Santa Monica stairs, which if you haven't been to them, it is crazy. We actually ran into Chris Paul there that day. Chris yeah. Paul did five stairs on his best day. His trainer told us they do five. We had to do 10, but not just 10 up and down we would go up, ran, run a loop, go down, run up 10, which is double in case you're worried about math there. Yeah. Double uh, yeah. so what Chris well, well, Paul. Two times two because the, the loop, Chris Paul didn't do a loop. Right. Yeah. So it's you're more than Chris Paul. Yeah. And then, and then actually one of the girls on the team like laughed us so many times that we actually had to do two more. So we ended up doing 12 total stairs and we were like dying. We're like, okay, we're ready for like lunch. We're ready to like get back to school. And the, the coach is like, yeah, lunch is here. We're like, great, great. And then they're like, yeah, but you have to like walk to it. I'm like, okay, that's weird. And so from where we were, we had to walk to these like benches, which it, it wasn't like weird. Like where else we're, we wouldn't have eaten on the side of the road. Like it made sense, but it was like, okay, weird. We're walking there, but fine, whatever. We're, mm. It's fine. We I'm walked. Dying. Well, yeah, we walked there. It was kind of like nice for our legs to walk. It was fine. And then we ate our lunch and we we're like, okay, getting ready to like go back to school. And they're like, oh yeah. So now you're going to walk to the pier, which is was probably like a mile and a half walk. And they're like, you have to walk together. And it was like a team bonding thing. So we're like, okay, like that's nice. But we're like going to do a beach day. Like that's fun. <laughs> so we walked to the beach. The coaches drove there. They're like, we'll meet you there. 
So we walked. Hollywood like drive slow, like next to you while you were running the whole time. <laughs> no, they like they wanted to get there first, and so we were all were walking like. Oh, I wonder what's what's gonna happen. Like, oh, it's by the pier. That's cool. Like, I wonder if we're hanging out or doing something fun. So we get there, and there's like sandbags everywhere, like huge, like like huge sandbags. And they were like, "Yep, we have partners for you guys, and somebody's gonna put a blindfold on, and the partner is going to tell you which direction to like scoop the sand in the sandbag, and then you have to carry the sandbag and make like a, a structure." All, with blindfolded with, with your partner telling you like where to put the sandbag and oh. like why like in my head I'm like why this is like I like was a so, I, I was like this is horrible like we were so tired oh you see, I think the sandbags were smaller like our backs were hurting they were huge sandbags so halfway through me and Noosh are just and Noosh is a freshman and is just like what did I get myself oh, yeah. into I'm like, we've never done this before. Why are we doing this? Like, this is so weird. So I'm like scooping sand, back, sand in and like we're, me and Noosh are struggling the most. I don't know why. And oh, then- Because you ran two miles before. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So then we're like making the structure. We couldn't see it because we were blindfolded, but we were making the structure. <laughs> then I was like, take off your blindfolds. Take off our blindfold. She's like, the water, like it's taking you guys so long that the water is like, gonna swoop away the sandbags you have to take all the sandbags down and redo all of them <laughs> we were like i almost started crying so i'm like I, i'm like looking at her like are you serious so then i have a blindfold on and then she just starts yelling at me with the blindfold i know you're rolling your eyes under the blindfold i'm like what and then i got in trouble for having a bad attitude but it just didn't see like the why to me like i yeah. needed the why and there was to me, no why. We never did it again. I don't think we ever yeah. got an apology, but we never did sure it again. Under that. your blindfold, you're turned to Noosh and you're like, how does she see me? How in the world does she see me? Noosh will never forget. Like, it's like hashtag never forget. It comes up in our stories and we make like a day of it. It's like, this is the day six years ago, the sandbag. Yeah, you count day. forward from that date, like a religious thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's like, we have to pay our respects because it was such a day. I wonder if like secretly like you guys are in the blindfolds and like they all got together as a coaching staff and they were like, this is really hard. Like, I don't know. Oh, for sure. Are you kidding me? They were, but they were like too far in. They already told it like how bad would it look on them if they were like, just kidding. Like we're not doing yeah. this anymore. Like they had yeah. to, we had to finish it. Uh, it seems so innocent when they wrote it down on paper, probably. Right. Like, Oh, sandcastles with blindfolds. This will be fun. Right. Yeah. But again, I think like the whole idea would have been cool but the yeah. sandbags were like this thing and like we just had our hand to scoop it. So like, <laughs> like imagine how long it would take to scoop, fill it in. And then we were getting in trouble because we weren't filling it all the way. I'm like, imagine filling a sandbag. That I at least a three-year-old plastic shovel, please. A three-year-old plastic shovel. And then carrying it, like it's like a 25 pound sandbag and putting it in the right place. Not, not just any place, the right place. <laughs> We've struck yeah. a nerve. She's, that was she's my going to day. right now. You're, re you're reliving the moment right now, angrily. <laughs> oh man, that is hilarious, though. I mean, I can uh, I can empathize, I guess, and see how bad that would be. But I also would like to be a fly on the wall and watch that go down. Oh my gosh, I, I bet the coaches were like laughing hysterically. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they're like back at home at the night. They're like, yeah, man, we got him good. Good one, guys. Yeah, and then like the whole next week, like I don't have back problems, but everyone has back problems. Noosh had Noosh had like sun yeah. rashes on her arms. Like she said she bought long sleeves forever. We were all like wounded from this one day. <laughs> I'm sure the coaches were like, "Oh shoot, <laughs> what have we done? What have we done?" Um, yeah, that's that is hilarious. That is a fantastic story. Yeah, we'll compare stories from Danusha to yours and see what happens. But uh, so moving forward now is on the UCLA status is like this is clearly a big shakeup now. You know, Val's moving on, Joe's in uh, Arkansas, right? And then Chris is stepping up, and like all sorts of stuffs going on. Like, what do you think is going to be the shakeout of all that stuff? I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I mean, obviously, when you have something in place for so long, a system in place for so long, it's going to be different. It's going. Yeah to be a transition it's going to take time right but I think with the girls that they have on the team and the culture that they've already set I mean half the team has knows what it takes to win a national championship 
So right, with right. leadership and with Kyla and Koshin and Felicia Hano mm-hmm. and, you know, that senior class being in place, I mean, they know good gymnastics and they yeah. can be leaders themselves. And I think that's what Val did a good job of teaching all of us on the team is kind of taking ownership of our gymnastics and taking ownership of the team when you get to that junior, senior um, really anybody on the team, but especially when you become a junior and senior. And so I know the girls are ready and prepared for it. So uh, Chris has obviously been there for so long. It's not like a, a completely shit, new shift with somebody else doing completely di- yeah, right. doing completely different, you know, like he knows and I'm sure he's going to, you know, change certain things to kind of add his own flair as he should. But it's, it has to be tough, right? Like, what do you keep as a tradition? And what do you change as, you know, making it your time now? Yeah, right. The roots are dug in there pretty deep. So you hope that I'm, I'm sure Val will still be around like via in person or on constant call. So I'm sure it'll work itself out. I have clearly high hopes for all of them next year. Yeah, but I mean, with Christina and with Dom and BJ, I mean, what a freaking great staff. Uh, yeah, right. They're awesome. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I think yeah, it we'll, takes out, right? yeah. here to just see how it, it all plays out. It'll be exciting, man. Definitely with the shakeup and with, you know, now that Tom's at Utah and, you know, our, Joe's moved over too. It'll be cool to see how everybody approaches their own kind of like first season. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of changes this year. On, on the college front, what are your thoughts on, I have two follow-up questions. One is what are your thoughts on the new format and the, the four on the floor kind of concept? I liked it. Um, I thought it was great. The one thing that I didn't love is that only eight schools make it to NCAA championships because I think it makes it more exclusive, which is good. But at the same time for, for the whole point in gymnastics to make it, uh, what's the word more impressive for certain programs to qualify and for programs to have that incentive to want to keep gymnastics around or to even add gymnastics, I think Mm -hmm. it's going to be harder to do that now. But in terms of like, you know, there's top 20, let's just say teams that could probably make that top eight. And so kind of seeing that parity this year and the competitions and not seeing teams that we're used to seeing there. I mean, it, the first day of NCAA championships was like the super six. Like it was, insanely tough to make four on the floor and so I mean we me watching and I was uh commentating for ESPN like that was really exciting it was wild and I enjoyed it I thought the format was great um I do miss the individual uh meet because I think that I mean, I guess I'm, I'm speaking as if I were a gymnast, but there was so many fun skills that I could add in on that individual day um, that girls aren't taking those risks anymore because why would you win the teams on the line? So that's the only thing that I wish that they could find a way to, to do that. And I still think that there are certain rules that need to be up to date because the level of gymnastics is just getting so good. I think that once you get to regional championships, that a new set of rules should apply. Like, you know, four, four of the five, four of the six gymnasts have to have an e-tumbling pass on floor or you get a deduction or a deduction on floor or, you know, because not all of the schools in the nation can keep up with that. But if you qualify to regionals, there should be some sort of like a, yeah, you separator. Ten o volts, or you get a deduction. You know, something yeah. like that to an incentive to want to do that those harder skills. Because I mean, as we saw from this past NCAA championships, like everybody's just getting so good that yeah. it's it gets boring when everyone's so good in a way. You know, yeah. and doing the same skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I would agree that it's definitely more exciting. That is for sure. If their goal is to make it more exciting and make it more, um, you know marketable and make people like, like people picking up. That's definitely good. I will say though, that from, from my point of view and definitely working with some of the athletes who go through this is like the coaches have to be much like very strategic about how the whole season goes and who's, who's healthy and who's ready and like possible three day competition. If you make it as one of those teams and like, it, it definitely gets a little bit more grueling, I think in terms of like the longevity of it with all that kind of stuff, but it also really makes it a more competitive sport where like you think about like the, you know, the NCAA basketball tournament, like you got to show up on the day and earn your spot. So I, I think that the thrill of it is really cool, but I, I hope that people think a little bit more long tail with how they treat the middle of their season to kind of push towards the end. 
Yeah, I, I also think it's cool that there can be more strategy, you know, with I think two days at regionals is brutal. And so yeah. for teams that aren't one of the top four teams, like they don't have that depth to compete more girls. And so for a team like UCLA or like Oklahoma or like Michigan, I know they switched some girls up. Oh, they didn't really have that depth this year. But some of the top schools that do have the depth, they can compete the depth on day one and kind of take that risk, depending on what event they're ending on, to rest their best girls for day two. So having that sort of strategy, I think, um, incentivizes coaches to make sure the depth squad is just as strong or yeah. almost just as strong as the, you know, A-list competitors. Yeah, right. Being able to build a, a whole team that has a skill level, that's hopefully enough where you can, you know, get everybody up to a higher average so they all compete a little bit. Right. Yeah. And my other question was very similar related when you're talking about the skill difficulty and stuff. What are your thoughts on, or your opinion, I guess, too, on like what we're seeing kind of happening is like Trinity Thomas and Michaela Skinner, who are kind of doing a little bit of both, who are kind of in the elite world and back. Because obviously from the men's side, it's like almost three quarters of the national team goes through college at some point and gets there. And like, that's always been a big um, deterrent for people to do big tumbling passes and do really hard skills because they're like a little nervous about, like you said, not hitting for their team and taking the risk. So I know it's a, I think it's a super, I'm a huge fan of it and I think it'd be awesome to see them all do it. But what do you think? I think it's amazing. I mean, someone takes Skinner, for example, that has really grinded it out and done all of her big skills since she got to college. I mean, that's impressive in its own right. And for her, you know, wanting to make the Olympic team being so close last time around, it, it makes, if I was in her shoes, I would want to go for it too. She's healthy. Yeah. She's actually, I think, I think going to be in a better place when she went to college, she cleaned up a lot of her form issues. So I actually think that she's going to be a better gymnast than when she came to college because she had to compete every single weekend. She has no problem competing. She's rock solid. She's very mentally tough. And now she has the form in the like sticks and the, the, that sort of experience under her belt too. So I think, I think she is going to be, a rock star in the elite scene going back after college. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the cool part of it too, for me is um, I think that it's, it's interesting to see people who are willing to kind of, like you said, grind it out and do both. But I don't know, I think that in college, you have so many more resources available to you. You have uh, sports psychologists, mental health providers, nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches, and AT, like you have so many things that you can learn about how you train and what you do. And like, I don't know, I mean, I'm not going to go into it, but maybe put up your bandages from an elite, you know, coming up season and stuff like that. Like, I think it's really cool. And people I've experienced the girls that we work with at our clinic who go to college for the first two years, they like learn a lot about themselves and how to take care of themselves. And I think that that puts them in a really good position to, you know, get stronger and be healthy and then go home and like train really, really hard and know like how much is the push and pull barrier there when you're older. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think nutrition too, like your body kind of settles in, um, you figure out like how much, practice your body really needs, how much cardio your body really needs. I think an older gymnast has more of experience in that than, than a younger gymnast. You know, you just know your body better, but yeah, I mean, it'll be, it'll be interesting seeing, I feel like Trinity was only at school one year. So I don't, I mean, even though she was a college gymnast, it's not, it's not like Michaela Skinner where she's been there three years. Like she knows the drill. I think everything yeah. still new for Trinity this year for her to fully, you know, be a college gymnast going back. I think she needs a couple more years to really have that sort of culture ingrained in her. Cause you know, after your first year, it's all still new. Yep. And also as you can probably attest, and I remember I felt very, very different physically senior year than I did freshman year in terms of scale volume and stuff, you know, coaches like, yeah. let's try two more vaults. I'm like, I think, I think my ankles are done for the day. I think I'm yeah. good. Yeah, that's true. Trinity might have a little bit more left in the tank, but I mean, if we're comparing it to Skinner, Sk I, I, she's, yeah. She's indestructible, man. I don't know how she did double doubles every time she competed. Like it is just impressive to me that her body was able to stay fresh throughout her, her whole time at Utah or three years of Utah. Um, so I wish her all the best, both of them. Yeah, I think it would be, I mean, I'm, I'm rooting for all of them who try to do that path internationally or not, because it just says that there's, there's another door that can be opened when you go to college. It's not like you close one and move on. You have the option if you want with, you know, if you take care of yourself and the staff around you takes care of you, like there's a good potential for you to do whatever your heart desires. And I think that's a really, really big thing for a lot of young 
young gymnasts to see, young female gymnasts especially, to see that like college isn't the end. And like um, talking with Becky, who's I think 29 now, and she's on her third Olympic cycle. And she's like, she's like, yeah, like I, I wish I'd known as a 14 year old that I was going to make it to 29 because I would have approached things a little bit differently. And uh, who knows whether that's mentally or physically or how you train and stuff like that. But like, man, this is, this is no longer a little kid sport anymore. And it's really cool to see people doing both. Yeah, I mean, I think it's different for international gymnasts, though, because they don't have that college, um, mm. you know, pressure or distraction or whatever you want to view college 12, as. 12 minutes back to back to back to back. Yeah, and so they also have a lot more, um, like, funding and sponsorships mm. and, and, you know, give away your eligibility because you're not worried about doing college gymnastics. Right. Whereas right. in the States, I mean, we just have so much depth in our country from the ground up that the college gymnasts going back have to compete not only to be better than, than the quad that they came from, but now they have to beat the girls that are, their bodies are six years younger than they are. So I, mean, yeah. I know when I was training and wanting to go back to the elite team, it was really scary because it was like, okay, not only do I have to be just as good as when I was at the Olympics, but now it's the new quad. So everybody is doing like way harder skills and you know, you have to keep up with that. They don't care how old you are. And so I think just in our country, it still is tougher to go back because of age. Yeah, but if no, there's two really people to do it, it's Skinner and Trinity Thomas. <laughs> Back, the end of conversation is we're rooting for you. We have our flags up in your name. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I will, I would be so, that would be so amazing to yeah, kind that'd of buy cool. those odds and to kind of change that uh, narrative for sure. Yeah. And uh, I guess the last little piece in the college thing is switching gears a little bit to a common theme that a lot of people have said on the podcast and things like that is like, I think, I don't know, college is so exciting and there's so many cool things so that a lot of kids from the get go are, are aiming for college only, you know, they, they, they think that like, that's their end goal. I know that was for me. I, you know, only wanted to go to college one because I wasn't that good to go anywhere else. But also I just thought like, I want a team, I want an environment, I want like all this stuff. And um, I think from what is your advice from multiple points of view here? So like maybe from the a lot of parents and coaches, I think are really important in this young kind of like 10 to 14 age range where like a kid has no idea what they're doing in five years anyway. So they're more important, but then uh, also from the gymnast point of view about what is your advice to those two people about, you know, how to approach that journey to college? I can only speak from my own experiences, but I was so lucky between the chemistry of my own parents and me and my coach and me and my coach and my parents. Like we were such a strong team unit the the three of us I mean the four of us together um mm -hmm. my coach really did a good job of understanding how to train me I think you know when I became an elite our biggest fights would be him telling me to do a certain assignment and me getting mad that he only thought I could do three or something yeah and his response would be no, we want to keep your body healthy. We have to, you're doing hard skills. Like, and, and to me as a younger gymnast, I, I was offended that because I wasn't doing two days and because I wasn't doing, you know, what some of the other elite girls were doing, I felt like I needed to make up with it with numbers. Right. And so right. thank God I had him to hold me back a little bit because I would have run my body into the ground with the skills that I was doing. And then um, you know, and I was appreciative that he always let me take ownership of my training and it was a team effort. It was, right. he'd ask me, how are you feeling today? I would honestly tell him, you know, like I had a really, I have a final tomorrow in school and I'm really stressed out and I just, I'm, it's just not a, like, I would be honest about how I was feeling that day and he would alter the assignment. You know, obviously there's times where you can't alter the assignment, yeah. but yeah. some days I would go in there and be like, I'm feeling really good. Like, can I do my hard assignment today? Because I'm, I'm really feeling it. And, yeah. um, he would do such a good job of just letting me have input when I got to the older level. Um, and so I appreciate that about our teamwork and really he knew when to push me and, and when to hold me back. Um, and so, and then my parents, uh, I just appreciate everything they have done for me. Like just, you know, uh, parents listening to this, like, you know, it's the same story, like driving your kid to the gym and <laughs> buying uh, yeah. their meats and making dinner so they can eat in the car. So when they get home, they can finish their homework. And just like my mom was a gymnast and my dad was a college athlete too. So even though they were athletes still just being the parent in my life and not the coach in my life, I know my mom's famous line would be, you know, you can't have a bad day or you, you can't appreciate a good day if you don't have a bad day because, you know, the, the better I got, the more tough on myself that I got. 
And mm -hmm. I was wanting, and the closer I got to, to making the Olympics. And so even if the practice was good and not great, I would be in a bad mood. And so it just got really, really tough at the end and just having my parents there for support and knowing that they were going to love me whether I made it to the Olympics or not. And they were going to mm -hmm. love me if I decided not to do gymnastics the next day or not. Um, it just knowing that my heart, I think made it my sport. Uh, so I don't know. I saw a lot of my teammates who were definitely better than me growing up. Their parents kind of ruin it for them because they were so pushy and they, they wanted to control it or they wanted to coach them or they wanted to just be like overly, you know, involved when really it's like, okay, if your kid wants to be great, they'll, they'll be great. They will. It'll be, it'll come from them. So I was happy that my coaches, I mean, my parents always let it, let that, let that motivation come from me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, the biggest thing that I take away from that is, is something that many other people have said too, is, is on the coaching side, it's about uh, education and it's about communication, right? So going back to earlier when you were scared, like the more you learned about stuff, like you felt better about it, but also like you have to educate the athlete. And it's something that I try very hard to do now. And I, my coach was actually very good at this too, is explaining why we were doing strength or why we were doing these numbers or why we're trying to keep your body healthy for a long season or stuff. But then constant communication and having a very radical transparency policy about like, you need to tell me how you're feeling. Like you need to trust me and say that if you tell me, I'm not going to brush it off and say like, suck it up five more. Like that's not a good approach to have with people. And I think that it's an error that I made as a younger coach was like a little bit of entitlement. Like I'm your coach, you do what I say. And there's times when like, like you said, you have to push like, like this is an important thing we have to push for. So I need you to just kind of like get through it here. But there's also times when you have to respect how people feel and that they have an equal voice backwards as you have forwards. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my, my coach always, there was like, like you mentioned times where it was, you, you have to do this and yeah. we would butt heads and it would be not a good day for either of us. Yeah, um, yeah. But the fact that, you know, he, he let me kind of be that driver um, in a lot of ways, or at least let me feel like I could be a little <laughs> bit of a driver. Um, I mean, control, yeah. When I did have a group, though, in a level 10 group, I mean, if, if Peter found out that we were, like, nursing a pain or an ache or something and we didn't tell him, we would be in big trouble. If, yep. he, had to, if he had to hear it from our parents, if he had to hear it from another girl, because, you know, you hear that happens, like, so-and-so, yes. it, like, tells on the girl, like, Chrissy's really hurting today and, like... I just want you to know because she's like really in pain. And then the coach is like, what? I had no idea. And so yep. if he heard it from a teammate or a parents. Like he wanted us to tell him where it was hurting, when it started hurting, why it started hurting and you know, how bad the pain is. Like, is it, is it an ache? Is it your muscles sore? Is it you're injured? You know, like really communicate that because that ultimately decided what my assignments were going to be And toward the end. I mean, it got hard because I'm like, is this a serious injury or am I just really sore? Like I, it was hard as a 15 year old. Borderline. Yeah. Borderline, probably all of all of the above, but it got really hard to figure out like, okay, do I need to see a doctor? Can I do this? Is something going to snap on my next term? But it, it did help me be more mindful of my body. I think you know, especially going to college. So I appreciate, it was annoying at the time. Let me tell you that it was so annoying, but I appreciate that so much from him. Yeah, right. Exactly. Good, uh, good takeaway for both of the sides listening to this podcast, either a gymnast or a coach is yeah. on the receiving end of that. Like, no, they probably have your best interest in mind if they're over asking about those things. And for the coaching side, it's like, it's always the most important thing to make sure your, your open communication about all these things is like forefront, you know? Yeah. And just I think letting your athlete know that you guys are on the same team. I know my coach did a good job of that. And, um, that was one way of him kind of showing or proving, if you will, uh, that he was on our team. Like he wanted us to stay healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, you know, it speaks to a, a bigger relationship you have with trust and like how it takes so long to build that trust. But when you have it and it's something you can communicate back and forth, it's, it's huge because it, it's, it's a big piece of how you make decisions and how you guide the journey together. Right. And it, it's also kind of what you you were saying with your parents. And, um, I forget somebody else said this as well, but they were saying like, I'm here helping you do gymnastics. This is not me. This is not my journey. This is, you know, you're the hero in this story. I'm helping you. And I think that the best, um, coaches and parents and medical providers that I've worked with seem to have that like very good 
self-awareness. Yeah, it was so annoying growing up because my parents never bribed me. And yeah. all my teammates' parents would bribe them with like dogs and oh, but oh my God. And, like, what a dog. Like leotard, like like lots of stuff. And I was like the only one that I was like, oh, if I get like a 36, can I get this? And my mom's like, I'll buy you a leotard. I'm not gonna like bribe you. I'm not bribing you to do well. Like if you do well because you worked really hard and you wanted to do well, not because I wanted you to do well. Um, which again was annoying at the time, but I think looking back, I appreciated the fact that it was, that was another example of that. It was all on me. Um, yeah. like my ownership. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It keeps the motivation in the right spot for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I am conscious of your time and I do not want to make you sit here all night. And so we will wrap things up. Although we, I feel like we could talk for another hour about like so much more stories and stuff like that. But, um, where can people find you and what are your plans moving forward? What's, what are all the details going on in your life? So leave this week for Colorado Beamsling boot camp. Um, and it's after this one, it's kind of like the first half of the summer is done. So that's exciting. We're approaching that halfway mark. Um, and then I will be starting my podcast up again. Um, not sure a begin date, but hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, I love doing my own podcast. I love being on other people's podcasts. I really didn't know much about the world before I started my own. And now I'm sure you guys, as you do too, have learned so much. And yeah. the more it's like, it's like the more I know about podcasting, the more I really like it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, again, appreciate you having me on your show. Um, to. yeah. And then July 1st, I'm going to start studying football. I haven't gotten my assignments for the year, but, um, in the fall I'll be doing more sideline for, uh, for football. So hopefully going to, you to grow the Beam Queen brand and continue moving forward with broadcasting and just kind of trying to keep all the plates spinning. You know how it yeah. is. Um, haven't dropped any yet, but uh, hoping just to kind of recharge the batteries whenever I can so I can be my best self and help other people be their best selves, especially at Beam Queen. So you can find me um, on Instagram at Samantha Peshek, P E S Z E K. Um, or you can check out our new website, beamqueenbootcamp.com. Yeah, it's um, fresh. It's fresh. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited about it. That's that's new this year. And then again, our new YouTube channel, just YouTube Beam Queen Bootcamp. So we have a bunch of ongoing educational videos on there, and um, our Beam Queen Bootcamp uh, mashup reveal, not reveal videos. Um, video recaps of our weekends mm -hmm. so you can get a little taste of what it's like to, to come there um, and then yeah if you want to check out any of my old podcasts you can go to I have cool show and I guess I could continue this for hours but that's probably good you can find me a lot of places if, <laughs> if yeah, someone wanted to steal me they probably had such an easy time um, like kidnapping me <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible way to end. Oh man. Here's my social security number. Here's my cell phone. Here's my, <laughs> here's my credit card number. Here's my apartment number. This is how you get in. So in case you want to just meet me in person, here I am. Yeah. Nobody please steal, steal Sam. That's not a good way to go about it. My mom always told me that they would give me back. So I don't oh, know. Oh, that's very nice. Why, why? Would they get sick of you? That's kind of like a backhanded compliment. <laughs> like, ah, give her back. No. As a little kid, I had a really terrible fear that I was going to get kidnapped. Like, I, I was a very, I couldn't sleep in my own bed. Like, I thought I was going to get kidnapped oh, my childhood. Um, really? My mom would just, I think that was her way of making me, making it a joke and making it funny. Like, don't worry, they would give you back. Like, yeah, but in the back of mind, she's like terrified of all the terrible people. She's like, oh God, please don't let that happen. She's like, no, that's fine. They'll give you back. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, man, if I wasn't so uh, confident in myself, that would really hurt my feelings. But <laughs> <laughs> Mom, why am I taking self-defense classes? No reason. No reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Very cool. Well, uh, I thank you for being on. Obviously, if you ever need anything from myself in the shift world, we are more than welcome to help you. And uh, I look forward to seeing things roll for you in the next year. It's going to be fun. Thank you. You too. I'm going to come and take a Beam Queen boot camp myself as an athlete. How's that? I love it. I love it. <laughs> Let me know when you want right. to. Yeah, I'm in. Okay. All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Dunzo. 
Sweet. Thanks. That was awesome.